Okay, so as was said, uh, we're gonna take the bus to explore the Bluetooth landscape. Um, brief little overview, just so you know what right, is kind of coming up. Oh. Okay, so let's dive into this. Um, who am I? Uh, I'm a PhD, I'm a Bluetooth security researcher and a security research scientist. Uh, general boilerplate stuff, all these things that I'm gonna be talking about are my own work, not that of any employer, past, present, future, all that good junk. So why are we talking about Bluetooth? Well, Bluetooth, whether you like it or not, enjoy it, or even really think it's, it's worth it, it's becoming pretty ubiquitous. So the two good examples that I have here are, the first is doing some wiggle war driving in an 80 person puddle jumper landing in an airfield. 80 people on a plane, 200 something Bluetooth devices all within range of just my phone. The other is, so the other, the other side of this would be, um, for those of you that may be familiar with a story about wired uh, Apple headphones not working without the Bluetooth capability, it basically boiled down to a product saving scheme so that by implementing Bluetooth chips, they could produce the cords for cheaper, even though they're supposed to be wired. So whether you like them or not, they're getting pretty ubiquitous and they're popping up just about everywhere. But why do we care about this? Well, really, as we'll hopefully see, uh, the Bluetooth landscape is a bit of a wild west. And so we should really have better insight for what Bluetooth wildlife is out there, get a better idea of what the landscape looks like, and ideally augment these tools so that the security research community can dive in and get their hands dirty into this stuff because it was a pain in the ass to figure out any of this. Uh, two things that I wanna make sure you all understand before we dive in because they'll be very key to following the rest of the talk. The first of is um, when you're looking at the Bluetooth protocol model, this bottom layer or controller layer or host controller interface is exceedingly important because what is going on in that layer is you have translation of hardware to software communication. You can't inject anything to this layer. You can't interact on this layer, but you can sniff it. So you can see everything that's going on, but any communication you're doing is either hardware directly or it is software on top of all this. The second thing you'll need to know is what does a BLE device look like? Well, essentially what you're running is what's called a GAT server without getting too much detail into it. Essentially what you have is a device that that device has some number of services on them. The services can have nested in them a series of characteristics. Those characteristics can have within them uh, a series of descriptors. Now that we've gone over the really boring stuff, we can get into the larger meat of this. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about my tool, uh, the Bluetooth Landscape Exploration and Enumeration Platform, or as I so lovingly call it, this bleeping tool. Um, what does it do? Well, the real purpose for having made this tool was a lot of the command line tools and things that are out there are depreciated by eight or plus years. Um, they've been, you've got odd tools that have been folded into other tools where you lose a little bit of really nuanced granular control on some lower levels. So the whole point for this was to have a device that could perform the enumeration of the landscape around you, enumerate these devices in a meaningful way so you can figure out what you can read and write to, and just give you a platform for being able to do this under a nice user interface. Now, there's some more advanced stuff that's getting worked on, such as adding in automation and logging to make it easier to do post-attack analysis or just even post-enumeration analysis. Um, capturing of signals is a little weird, but the basics and, and stuff are all in there. And more interestingly, I started adding some points for doing some cartography of the landscape that we end up seeing as we, as we search for uh, devices. So what you can do is you can think of this tool as kind of a set of binoculars. Um, as you go about uh, the Bluetooth landscape, what you might want to do is go on a safari. So let's go looking for what devices are out there, right? What Bluetooth animals do we see and, and what, what, li uh, what wildlife is out there? What do they look like? Do they, or do they have weird characteristics? What are the outliers that are out there in the world when we go looking around? So here is uh, the training data I'm gonna give you guys. Uh, I think you can figure out what device this is. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It is a Pixel 4a device. Um, there's some maybe interesting information here, right? We have some service data that is, is kind of present. Um, not really sure what these, de well, so, okay. So everything BLE is hex. It gets represented here as decimal, but almost all communication back and forth is, is hexadecimal. So we've got some interesting hex values. Maybe that's, that's kind of cool. 
If we use Bleep to take a look at the characteristics that are here on this device, we see, okay, here's this really interesting hex string that maybe means something super important. I'm not a Google Pixel developer, I don't necessarily know. But it's, it's unique to this space. Now, if we take a look at a device that I'm not gonna tell you who made it, what do you notice about it? So one part is that it's decided to name itself the same as its hardware uh, interface. So okay, it's using a MAC address as a name. Maybe that's a means to kind of hide itself. Um, instead of service information, what we have is manufacturer data. And what we see here is a UINT uh, number along with, again, some set of hex data attached to it. Those of you who are painfully uh, aware of the Bluetooth SIG documentation know what device this is already. But let's keep looking. So we use Bleep to take a look at the characteristics and descriptors that are there. It is a hot mess staring at this thing. We see maybe some interesting descriptors that are perhaps a binary value, but let's use Bleep to only read back the characteristics. Now, can you tell me what device this is? Yeah, pretty, pretty straightforward. It's an Apple device that UINT76 is a dead giveaway. That's the manufacturer code for Apple. Um, we also see it's a watch running version 6.6. .6. So now we've got a clear picture of, of the device that is in front of us. Now, here's a similar examination of an iPhone. And you'll notice here as well that, uh, once again, you don't have the name necessarily hiding itself. You do see that UINT number one more time, so you can identify it again from the manufacturing data that's there. But then we also see this very odd uh, error here at the bottom. That is bleep. I've written all the error handling on it. So what bleep believes is going on is that there's an authentication event based on a code that's delivered um, on that HCI layer that we'll get into later. Um, and it believes that some sort of pairing request has failed. So okay, bleep is able to not only try to get an idea of what the landscape is, but also tries to give you an idea of what are, what are the issues that are happening under the hood. If we take a look at one more device, which I'm not gonna give away, um, here what we're doing is we're using Bleep's pretty print uh, function in order to print it more in that structure that I was telling you about earlier. So here's the top level service, a nested characteristic, descriptor. If we take a look at uh, service 0010, um, which this is a handle, the terminology in BLE and Bluetooth gets very annoying after a while, but the point is on this one, we start seeing some names. We start, see, or we start seeing codes, maybe version numbers down here. If we keep looking at the device, we can see a little more information. Again, we've got a version number, and most importantly here, Zebra Technologies. We just found a zebra on a safari hunt. <laughs> now, I know from my own uh, personal life and work I have done that Zebra Technologies in this case is a package scanner, a, a physical package scanner, it's most likely a handheld device that used to scan barcodes, uh, get signatures, all that sort of stuff. So let's take a look at the details on this device. So here what we're doing is we're using a deep dive mode that is also in Bleep and it will go through and print out all attached information for all characteristics, descriptors and services that it has enumerated on the device. And so once again, you know, there's some interesting strings. Maybe we get some version numbers. I mean, there, there's a lot of info here, but maybe it's nothing, right? I wrote the tool, why do you trust me? I could be lying to you and this is just doing stuff that I think will trick you into using it. Well, the way we can do that is let's go deeper. So if you remember that HCI layer I was telling you about, what we need to do is we need to start examining communications on that layer, see what we can tell about the communication that's being sent there and corroborate whether or not bleep is actually a useful tool or just a fun hobby that is hallucinating and doing its own thing. So here is communication for two Bluetooth devices communicating BLE on, an, on just that HCI layer. This is using a tool known as BTMON, um, again, open, simple to use. Most folks that are developing Bluetooth are using it to sanity check their work. What's important here is that you can see the direction in which communication is going based on the uh, arrow brackets that you get. The color coding makes it a little easier to read, but what you're seeing here is you've got an attempt to read some handle. So if you remember that handle is just another way to identify characteristics and things. Um, it's complaining about insufficient authentication. It then attempts to pair, goes through this pairing process, and we hit some issue about an agent not, not existing. So okay, that ends up being detrimental to us because authentication fails, and down here the device ends up disconnecting us from its communication. But hey, 
Now we can kind of read what's going on under the hood and make sure that, that what we're seeing is what we expect. So here I've got another uh, capture from BTMon. And it's, it's pretty easy to see what's going on here, right? I mean, you've got uh, an Intel Corporation device. Now, there is some information that even the uh, BTMon doesn't know what the hell this is because Intel just decided to use this device flag. What does it mean? I have no idea. I don't work at Intel. I don't do their, their uh, Bluetooth development. But we see that the device continues to communicate. We're not getting the same authentication error. So we get instead a connection response, some configuration requests. That's great. It then blasts an insane amount of information because it's telling me about every capability that it has on the device. Towards the end of this blast of information, we see it gets a complaint about A2DP sync and source. Okay, maybe that won't, that won't tank me entirely. Unfortunately, we keep going and it actually does because since that is a key part of, of this Intel device, it ends up leading to a remote user termination connection and disconnects me entirely. So I've shown you two, two fun examples of this. Now, uh, raising your hands, how many of you recall what was going on with Bluetooth last year and a certain uh, dolphin named device that was messing around with Apple? Yeah, so let's go bobbing for some apples and see what's weird about them and what kind of difference we've seen since that time. So here I've got the HCI capture for that iPhone uh, communication I was showing you earlier in Bleep, right? And what did we see there? We saw, oh, it screamed something about authentication and not being able to pair. So what we see in the HCI communication is once again, here's that read request for this handle. Uh, we end up getting an error response to that, screaming about ins uh, insufficient authentication. If we recall from the earlier one, it ends up not being able to authenticate and the device ends up disconnecting us. Okay, fun. So does it happen every time? So here I'm taking a look at yet another uh, Apple iPhone device and we see again that same sort of pattern. You've got a handle that it attempts to read from, insufficient authentication. It's not necessarily the same handle, but you get this, this pattern of activity. And what we notice is this sense of, okay, well, you can start reading from this Apple device up until some error response happens, and then we'll kind of forget about it. Now, it's not just Apple devices that I've seen this on since last year. Um, this is just a small list of handles that I've seen for various devices. The unknowns are just ones that hid their identity well enough. I couldn't quite identify what it was. Um, but most importantly, what do we notice about the pattern of this, of this behavior? We notice that essentially we're, we're communicating with the device until we reach some panic point, trip this panic reaction, and the device freaks out on us. So what does Bleep show for this from its side? Well, when using Bleep, we end up getting errors telling us that the device is, has disconnected. So okay, we're, we're seeing the same information both on that HCI layer and from Bleep itself. So now we need to start mapping this problem because I would like to get around this. I'm tired of every Apple device just telling me I can't talk to it. Um, so I decide I'm gonna start mapping these little landmines I keep walking across. And you know, the bigger question is, can we prevent this disconnection? Is there maybe information hidden behind there that they're, they're just trying to prevent me from getting at it because of the way that I'm going about it? And so what I did was augment how Bleep would end up collecting this information. Normally what you're doing is you're communicating to the device and collecting the gap information, which is the general access profile. Those are those um, levels of details that we saw earlier that had the name, the alias, the Bluetooth address, high level stuff. Um, but what I end up deciding to do is we'll create a map that we can use in order to track which characteristics we, we read, see if there's any issues. Once we've got that skeleton, we'll create the coordinating map. Once we do the enumeration, pretty straightforward. Check the map. Is this a known bad issue? It is, great. I don't want to bother reading from it. It's going to waste all, it's just going to waste my time. It's not known to be an issue, great. Let's try to read from it. Get back the response. We'll do some error checking on, on the communication we received back. If it turns out to cause an issue, great. Mark it as bad and we'll just go that way rather than some systemic panic and, and, and run. And so we run this on Bleep, taking it against an iPhone. Um, and we see here that we're still reading from it, right? No, no errors yet. We see we get towards some of these characteristics that we saw earlier, like 0010, but it continues going. So, okay, well, what if, what about some of the other ones that we saw on that list, right? 002E. Well, we keep going and no, we managed to actually get past 2E. All right, well, 
does anything ever trigger? Doesn't feel like it, right? We get all the way to the end of this menu. There's no errors, nothing screaming about anything. But again, don't believe me, right? I wrote bleep. For all I know, I did a really shitty job and just it, it's hallucinating answers and telling me that, it, that it's fine. So let's check that HCI layer. And what do you all notice about this output? Yes. Yes, exactly. So the only reason the device disconnected us is that it timed out. I can tell you from at the time I was scanning this because the device got away from me, but we didn't trip a panic reaction. This device let us read all of its characteristics through without kicking us off or throwing us off anywhere. So awesome. Hey, we did it. Um, this grabbed the wrong version of it. Okay, this is, this is a little uh, more clustered than I'd want, but what are the things that we end up learning from this? Well, okay, first and foremost, Bluetooth devices are really platform specific. Manufacturers are right now basically dictating how these devices get implemented and how they're put out in the wild. It really leads to this wild west sort of in, environment in it. Um, with that, hey, we found an actual zebra on a safari hunt. I don't know many talks you can say that you got to see a zebra, so I, I think that is, that is worth it. Um, the more interesting two points are these two at the end. So what, uh, first and foremost, what I found most interesting is that it appears that Apple is using canaries in order to prevent you from continuing to enumerate devices and characteristics. From what I could tell from what the flipper was doing during, what is it, Sour Apple, Bad Apple, whatever the hell we decided to name that one, um, is that it was essentially systematically going through and just blasting communications against the, uh, against the characteristics and the GAT server that's running. So by just having this panic reaction disconnecting, they're hoping to circumvent that. Um, the second one is depending on how you present yourself as a Bluetooth device will change the interaction you get with, with uh, devices. So that A2DP audio sync and source issue that I saw earlier, um, once I installed Pulse Audio on this machine and scanned again, I ripped my headphones away from my phone to my laptop without realizing what had happened. Until all of a sudden I'm hearing a YouTube video I didn't know was even playing. Um, so it's fun stuff. Uh, for those of you that want to play with the tool, this is where you go um, to find it. Uh, it's looks like this, very straightforward. I'm gonna show you guys a bit of a demo of it operating, so um, just so that you can get, again, some more experience looking at it and seeing how it works. Um, so let's go to the demo. Um, so here, as before, I have uh, that B team on so that we can take a look at the background communication um, along with it. And then here, we've got a bleep. In order to start it up in user mode, it is this simple. You just have to have Python installed and the requirement libraries, which are all on GitHub. Um, but you just write uh, bleep, tech M for the mode, user for user mode, hit go. Um, it will start enumerating around the room and seeing what devices are in range. There are some annoying things um, about uh, the Dbus and how it works. It will then start producing a series of devices. Um, this. Yes, there is a Pokemon Go Plus device around here that I've been trying to talk to for the last two days and it will not speak to me. Um, the, the MPY UART is a Pico W um, server that I've, I've made to help test this against. There's this Oppo A15. You will notice that a lot of these other names are more or less trying to hide themselves from us. Um, that last one is my phone, uh, which, fun fact about uh, BLE, even though my Bluetooth is off on my phone, it will still show up. I won't be able to talk to it, but I can still enumerate its location within the wild. So picking one of these devices, okay, so this is the fun thing about the D-Bus. The D-Bus will forget. Uh, so if you take too long to pick a target, it will just tell you I've forgotten about this, I don't know what the hell you're trying to talk to. Um, so as again, we do uh, that M user, pick a device at random, um, and let it go and try to communicate to it. So taking a look on the back end, we can see that um, the device can, has connected, we attempted to get features, and the device did not like this and has booted us off. So once again, we're seeing that, that panic and I hate you reaction. Bleep will attempt to still communicate to it a few times. It ends up leading to a timeout in those cases. Um, yes, it, it looks slow and is confusing, hence the need for having this B team on, again, if you're getting really in, into the weeds and under the hood. 
Um, but because I can't always control the environments around me, I have also made demos. So if we take a look at, say, the BLE CTF and decide that we are going to brute force a series of writes to it, um, much like before, you'll see that it's going to type uh, bleep tech m user. I added a dash d file for this version, which I'm going to upload, which allows me to identify a device. Uh, that is because I didn't know how many Bluetooth devices you all were going to bring, and I didn't want to go digging for it. Um, as we expect to see, it's going to go through and enumerate the device. Here's that gap layer information. Um, the text is really big, so all of this is kind of flying by. What it's done is it has enumerated all the characteristics on the device. We are then generating a list of the characteristics that it found, using that list of characteristics to then perform an action. So here what we're doing is we're reading from a characteristic that we've decided. Uh, once I hit enter, I am then picking a characteristic uh, that I know has um, a flag on it where, well, well, sorry, here we're showing the score. Here's that read all that shows again all those characteristics in a nice, easier to read um, format. Here we see that there's a write up there where it's attempting to brute force. So I'm saying, okay, write to this device, use brute force mode. Uh, it will then ask me how many characters the write should be whenever it hits enter and continues. Um, so I'm picking that characteristic. I'm saying it needs to use two, bi uh, two bytes of information, start brute forcing it. And it will just go through the entire spectrum uh, from zero to 255 and write everything it can to there. Um, what we'll see at the end of this is uh, the um, write characteristic that had the flag that told us to brute force these values will end up producing a flag. It's a BLE CTF, so it's a CTF we're playing with. Um, we will then go and read from that device. Here is that flag. We'll then copy the device, write it to the score characteristic, which is separate from where you read from it. Um, where here we go, picking the characteristic to read from, which I think is char 0029 to B. I was off by one. Um, so B is where we write uh, the string to. Great, it's written it here as a string instead of an integer as we saw before. Um, we then read from the characteristic and uh, see that we have in fact scored the flag. Hooray, we've got basic IO interaction. Um, I've got demos for signals, I've got demos for this and that, um, but I would like to leave some time for questions. So please, as this continues playing in the background, ask questions as you need. Don't have time for questions. Oh. Even better. Okay. Well, if you want to talk to me more about it, please come up. Otherwise, thank you for uh, listening to my insane ramble about Bluetooth wildlife. <laughs>